Hi, and good morning. This is Mr. Reyes once again. We are continuing our conversation in phlebotomy in chapter 10 of our textbook. Today, we're gonna to be discussing topics, uh, a very specific topic, uh, which is capillary punctures and the equipment that is related to it. It's a very important part of uh, the phlebotomist uh, duties. Uh, capillary punctures are performed on a routine basis, more so in other specific areas of the hospitals, especially in the newborn areas, the pediatric areas, but of course they're also performed in the adult sections as well. So we're gonna continue the conversation. Uh, we're gonna start off by discussing uh, some of the equipment that is needed uh, or used, utilized in this area. So why do we have to collect uh, capillary punctures? They are necessary at some point for various reasons, which we'll discuss. So. Let's delve into it and uh, talk about some of the topics that we're going to be discussing today. We're going to be looking at some of the terminology. So again, it's very, very important that you are familiarized with the with the uh, terms that are discussed in this in this chapter, such as uh, intracellular fluid. Uh, lancets, microhematocrit tubes, and so on. It's very, very important because if you don't have that terminology understanding, then you may perhaps miss some of the other uh, uh, required knowledge that you have. So again, go back and look at the um, terminology that is due so that you can better understand the conversation. We are going to identify capillary puncture equipment and uh, list the order of draw because there is a slightly different order of draw for capillary punctures versus uh, venous punctures. And we'll look at that in later on this chapter. And uh, we'll describe the theory behind uh, capillary punctures. What is the composition uh, of a capillary blood sample? What is in that blood? And we'll discuss that more in detail so you can understand why um, we have to make sure that we label specimens with the particular types of uh, blood specimens. We're going to identify uh, the difference again between capillary arterial and venous specimens, the composition and reference values or ranges. Uh, we'll look at capillary punctures. When is it indicated? When is it not indicated? And of course, demonstrate the knowledge of site uh, selection criteria. Where can you perform these punctures on uh, newborns, uh, pediatrics, and adults? So it's very important that you uh, know when uh, it is uh, a good idea and when it's not. We'll also look at how to collect capillary specimens, which is a procedure uh, we're going to be performing on adults, infants, and children. Of course, we're not going to be doing it on, on infants or children here, but we will be performing it in adults. And um, we'll describe the specimen collection procedures and explain clinical significance of capillary blood gases, which is also a common uh, exam that is performed in adults, more so than children, but it is uh, done a lot in newborns when they have uh, their bone with respiratory problems. Uh, neonatal bilirubin, that's another uh, very common newborn screenings. We'll look at how to perform a newborn screening test and tests that cannot be performed on capillary specimens. As we said earlier, specimens uh, for capillary punctures are very limited in the amount of blood. Therefore, you cannot perform every single test on capillary blood. So some people don't understand that, but we'll explain why. And of course, we'll learn how to prepare uh, routine and thick blood smears. We'll be practicing those uh, procedures later on. And uh, we know now that there is equipment that actually can help us perform this procedure uh, perfectly every single time. But for your knowledge, you should be aware of peripheral smears as you will see it. Uh, you will see questions about the topic in the national certification exam. Why do we need to collect um, uh, peripheral smears? We'll look at that in a bit and identify tests performed on some of the smears. What tests are performed? Why are they done? And what kind of patients require this? this type of collections. All right, so we've uh, introduced ourselves into the capillary puncture equipment. Uh, we've seen some of the equipment that, that, we, uh, that we're gonna be using. And uh, obviously uh, criteria that has to be uh, met for a Lancet device to be considered a Lancet device is that it has to be sterile. All the specimens are, are sterile, uh, such as the one that we'll be using here. This is a, a Lancet device, okay? And it is very commonly used in this manner. Of course, there's various presentations, colors and so on, but they have to be sterile. They cannot be used um, more than once. Uh, they are meant to be disposable. They have a sharp point inside them, okay? And it is retractable. 
that is one of the OSHA requirements that um, that defines a a lancet device. It has to have a permanently retractable needle or blade. That means when once you activate it, it cannot uh, be activated once again. All right. So these again, they're designed for either finger punctures or heel punctures, as it is on newborns. Finger puncture lancets, again, they come in various forms and the color will determine the depth of, of, the, of the puncture, okay? That means how deep is the needle gonna go in the skin, all right? So uh, as we can see, we don't wanna use one that is, um, that is too, too deep on an infant because it will cause damage to the, to the bone. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So they come in various presentations, okay? But I'll always remember that the OSHA required Lancet safety feature is a permanently retractable blade. If it doesn't have a permanently retractable blade, then it is not, um, does not meet the criteria for a, a Lancet device, all right? Heel puncture Lancets are a little bit different. Uh, if you look at the PowerPoint slides, you'll see that they're different uh, colors again. It, it, they come in various shapes because of the depth of the puncture. Sometimes uh, you, you need a deeper puncture and uh, you are able to collect a, a good amount of blood from um, that puncture because the, the lancet device itself has a wider blade and it makes a bigger cut and you won't have as much trouble collecting the specimen versus using the regular lancet device. So make sure you make the proper selection of equipment when you're going to perform a newborn. The last thing you wanna do is uh, lose your blood flow and having to puncture the infant once again, which is not a not a good idea. Now, once you uh, perform your your lancet, your puncture, you will be collecting specimens in micro collection containers. These are very uh, small containers that have a you know limited amount of space for blood. They're plastic. They used to collect very small amounts from capillary punctures. Some come with a narrow capillary tubes attached, to, such as the ones we've seen here, the purple. And these little tubes will help you to draw the blood into the micro collection container by an action called capillary action. It means that the blood will automatically fill the space in the tube and drop into your micro collection tube. And we do this uh, using the proper technique so that we don't uh, collect excess uh, ex uh, intracellular fluid. All right, uh, they are colored just like your vacuum containers. So that means they have a lavender color. It means it has EDTA and so on. They have expiration dates and so on. So make sure that you check your equipment before you're gonna be using, all right? They should have markings for minimum and maximum fill levels so that you're able to collect the proper amount of specimen. There are other various uh, presentations of these, but um, and again, you're gonna to have to follow the order of draw. So you see the colors in picture A, the capillary specimen collection is, used, is useful for pediatrics, all right? Remember that we're gonna be talking about the different amounts of blood that you can collect from, uh, from newborns, from uh, pediatric patients, and even adults. Uh, there is a certain amounts of blood that you can collect at once. And it's very, very important for you to remember that. You don't wanna exsanguinate someone or cause complications for the patient because you drew too much blood. Okay, so again, capillary specimen collection is especially useful for pediatric patients in whom removal or larger quantity of blood to prevent puncture can have serious consequences. So you must always verify uh, with your physicians, with the primary caregivers, the nurses, whoever's in charge of that patient, so that you can collect the right amounts of blood. There's other equipment called micro collection. Uh, tubes, okay? Now these uh, containers are very, very small and they're for the most part used to collect uh, hematocrit, hematocrit uh, or blood uh, specimens, okay? The hematocrit is part of your blood and it gives you a, a percentage of amount that is in, uh, uh, hemoglobin that is in your blood, okay? So this hematocrit tubes are very useful for that. Again, when you're trying to limit the amount of blood that you're gonna be collecting, these uh, disposable narrow bore plastic or plastic um, devices will be the best uh, equipment for, again, for newborns or pediatrics when uh, the infant already has low blood counts. So make sure you're familiar with it. These again, fill by capillary action, just like the other tubes. So as soon as you, um, you present the micro collection tube into the blood, the blood will automatically fill that space 
these tubes are filled with ammonium heparin. So that means that uh, they are coated with uh, heparin, which is an anticoagulant, and therefore the blood will not coagulate. And you need very, very small amounts of blood. Maybe a drop or two will be enough to fill these bloods. They use primarily for hematic determinations. After you fill them with blood, you must have, uh, have to seal them with a, a plastic or a clay sealant. So this is part of the equipment that will be requiring when you're performing this collection. All right, there's other equipment that you're gonna be using as well, which is not too common. We don't collect capillary blood gases on infants very often, but uh, unless they require it because of either they're having shortness of breath or they have discoloration, they look a little bit um, uh, purplish, bluish, right? So, uh, or cyanotic is the term. Uh, we may need to collect capillary blood gases on these infants, okay? So capillary blood collection tubes have several things, several uh, parts to that equipment, okay? It's like a, it comes in a kit. So capillary blood gases include the nerve plastic capillary tubes, which are very small, a, a stirrer, which goes inside the tube, a magnet that is used to move the stirrer back and forth, okay? And plastic caps, obviously, to seal the uh, collection tubes. So that all that is an equipment. Now this specimen requires special handling. So you have to be familiarized with this handling process, which usually includes uh, placing these um, collection tubes in uh, ice slurry, not ice cubes, not ice water, but ice slurry, because you want these specimens to be uh, not frozen, but very cold to minimize the amount of oxygen that is being used by the cells in the blood, okay? So again, capillary blood gas equipment is used very, um, not too often, but you have to be familiar with it. We're gonna be working with my microscope slides, okay? These slides are the ones that are used um, to perform blood smears. And uh, as the word implies, a smear, right? It's when something kind of just uh, is uh, smeared onto a glass. We're gonna be using uh, uh, food coloring to perform these, um, these blood smears, okay? It's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, it does require a lot of practice and very good technique to make a, an acceptable smear. All right, now, however, there are new machines that can perform this for us, so that is a very useful machine. Uh, we don't have to waste time. Uh, it's done perfectly every single time. So again, we'll be looking at that later. Uh, warming devices. Warming devices are very, very important. Now, there's uh, pre-manufactured devices that you can use uh, to arterialize your specimen. To arterialize means to bring more arterial blood to your puncture site. So we're going to need a warming device. Again, we don't want to use warming devices directly on the skin. We're going to always go to put a little barrier. Okay, you have the syringe. Uh, the syringe is, is used is the one that is used to collect the specimen. Now, again, this may not be within your scope of practice. Maybe uh, for an advanced uh, phlebotomist or even respiratory therapist, which are usually the ones given the task to collect capillary blood gases because they are trained to perform this procedure. It does require uh, a several steps, several things that you have to do before you collect uh, the specimen. So. Again, if you're not knowledgeable in this, uh, in this um, specimen collection, do not perform it because you may cause injury to the patient. All right, the specimen will be collected from an artery, okay? So you need your arterial blood gas syringes, which is the one you're gonna be collecting the specimen with, uh, your collection tubes, which are very, very small, uh, the stirs that are gonna be used to, to mix the blood in the tube, and your plastic caps that go on each end so that obviously the blood doesn't spill. So, uh, that is what the equipment that is used. There's a syringe, There, that is your collection tube. There are your stirrers, your stirrers and your magnet, okay? So that is some of the equipment that is used. Again, you may not get to use it if you're not uh, well-versed in this uh, technique. So what is a capillary specimen? What kind of blood are you going to be collecting during your procedure? So our arteries bring nutrients, hormones, oxygen, to all the tissue in your body. Every single cell part of your body gets these, right? Via your arteries, right? Your arteries are your the expressway of nutrients and hormones and, and uh, blood gases and so on. 
Once that all those nutrients and oxygen are, are delivered, then it has to make its, its way back on back to the heart so it can go to the lungs, pick up oxygen, and again, pick up more nutrients, right? It goes to the your intestines, picks some nutrients and so on. So once it makes its way back, before it does makes it into the veins, it has to reach a, an area called the, the capillary beds, the capillary beds. I think of this as a small marketplace where everybody goes and exchanges, you know, uh, goods. In this case, we have your arteries, which branch off from your heart. They all start from here. They branch off and they get smaller and smaller as they go away. They become what we call arterioles. And then as they get smaller and smaller, they become capillary beds. Okay, capillary beds. The same thing is for the veins. The veins also uh, branch off from your heart and they return, okay? They return back everything that was dropped off from the capillaries, all the waste, everything that is not utilized, uh, any gases that are released from the cells are picked up in the, in the capillary beds and pushed through your uh, veins, which are in this case called venules or very small veins, and then make its way back into the, into the, back to the veins and back into the heart. This is caused by the heart pumping. Okay, the heart is continuously pumping, so every, all the blood has been pushed through through the capillary beds, back into the veins, and then back into the heart, and so on. Okay, so this is, remember, the cardiac cycle. This is what happens every single second of your life, okay? So when you perform a puncture on a capillary bed, in this case, let's say the fingers, okay, you will be collecting a, a sample with a mixture of arterial, venous, and capillary blood very important that you know that okay so it's not either arterial or venous it's a mixture of all these so you have a lot of different kinds of fluids that you will find in this sample all right the in between the cells there's also something we call interstitial and intracellular fluid so again you have even more different kinds of fluids that are in going to be in the sample but we're going to try to limit the amount of interstitial right the the fluid that is in between your skin and then we have fluid that is in the cells all right, and then we have your capillary blood, all right? However, this sample most closely resembles an arterial sample. Why? Because of the force that has been produced by your heart as it's pushing the blood into it, you're gonna find that a lot of this blood is more, more arterial-like than venous-like, okay? So keep that in mind. So for that reason, we're gonna have different reference values, okay? We're not gonna have the same values that we use for veins because they're more arterial blood. So we have to keep that in mind. The capillary reference values may differ slightly from venous values. Maybe not a whole lot of difference, but again, we have to make sure that, that, uh, that we let our technologists know what kind of sample we're providing for them. Glucose concentrations are higher in capillary blood. Again, why? Because you have your sugars running in your arteries and since your capillary, uh, Samples are more arterial, then we have higher glucose concentrations. And that's why the main reason we perform a, a, um, a capillary puncture to collect a glucose sample when, when uh, we cannot collect a venous sample, okay? Other um, elements in capillary uh, blood samples are your total proteins, calcium, potassiums, uh, are lower in capillary blood versus venous blood. What are the indications for capillary puncture? When do we need to collect an, um, a capillary puncture in adults or older children? When uh, the veins that are available are very fragile or must be saved for other procedures. Perhaps the patient uh, requires a, some kind of a surgical procedure on their arms and uh, the physician has ordered no vein puncture no that specific arm, they were, might have to collect a venous puncture again you must keep in mind what kind of tests you need to collect for. You cannot just collect uh, any kind of um, specimen or capillary because it's not going to be sufficient blood for it. Or when there's been uh, very various um, attempts to collect from a vein and nobody has been able to collect it, you might consider a, a capillary puncture. Again, only if the test uh, you know, can be done with that small amount of blood. The patient has clot forming tendencies. Many times we will perform punctures on patients that, uh, that clot very quickly. The blood will stop flowing right away. And this may be a reason why uh, you can collect the capillary puncture. 
the patient is very, very afraid, okay, of needles, okay, not that lances are not needles, but they can't see it, so that may um, uh, help them cope with that procedure, so uh, that's another reason. There are no veins accessible. Maybe the patient has IVs in both arms, or they have um, the dialysis graft in both arms, maybe they have mastectomies in, in arms, et cetera. Uh, if there is no possible way we can puncture the arms, the veins in the arms, then we might have to consider a capillary puncture. Point of care testing. Point of care testing is something that is done every single day uh, by phlebotomists and, and other healthcare team members. Uh, we do usually glucose checks. Every day we perform glucose checks on patients. Uh, diabetics, we have to perform this test every single day, various times a day. So it could be considered, it is a point of care testing because it is done at the bedside of the patient. That's why we call it point of care. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Now, what about children? When can we perform capillary punctures in infants and very young children? Uh, because of the, the small uh, blood volume that they have, okay, they have a higher risk of developing iatrogenic anemia. You remember that term, iatrogenic anemia. This is when we cause anemia uh, by do, performing too many blood draws. Okay, iatrogenic anemia. So make sure you know that term. You will see it on your national certification exam. We have um, kids that have a risk of cardiac arrest because of the low blood volume. You, yeah, you can perform capillary uh, punctures. In this case, you may perform either a heel punctures or maybe uh, finger punctures. When venny punctures are very difficult, they may damage the veins or other tissue around them. If their uh, deep veins can are hemorrhaging, uh, they have little blood clots or infections or, you know, when there's a the risk outweigh the benefits, we prefer to go uh, with a um, capillary puncture whenever possible. Again, we have to keep in mind the type of test that needs to be performed and needs to be processed so that we can collect enough blood for the, for the test. Risk of injury due to restraints needed for any puncture. Uh, sometimes, well, many times kids will not cooperate uh, and, um, Holding kids in place, it can become very challenging. They're, you know, can get a little strong, and if we're not um, careful enough, we can actually injure them. So, in that case, we would just perform a capillary puncture. Capillary blood is preferred specimen for some tests. Uh, some uh, physicians will specifically ask for a capillary blood sample versus a venous uh, blood sample. A test that cannot be collected by um, capillary puncture. Uh, most erythrocyte sedimentation rate methods. Uh, ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation rate is a, is a test that is done to measure uh, inflammatory process. Okay, when somebody has perhaps a rheumatoid, arthri uh, rheumatoid arthritis or some other kind of autoimmune disorder that uh, has a, a, it causes inflammation, these uh, uh, doctors will order an ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation rate but it cannot be done on a capillary puncture. Okay, that for sure, that's going to be done and has to be done in a venous sample, all right? Coagulation studies cannot be done in capillary punctures because there's not enough um, plasma that will be done, uh, taken out of the, of the blood sample. You wouldn't have enough plasma to run the specimen uh, in the machines. Blood cultures cannot be performed with capillary blood. That's just not enough blood to be able to, to, uh, to grow enough bacteria in the, in the, blood, in the, blood, um, uh, in the blood media, okay, in the, in the bottle media. Tests that require large volumes of serum or plasma, obviously, again, cannot be performed by capillary puncture. So every time you're going to collect uh, a, a capillary puncture, uh, you have to keep in mind what test is going to be uh, performed. And if it's one of these coagulation blood cultures or ESRs, remember that is, is no, not gonna happen. Now, there's some patients that will insist you, on you collecting a capillary puncture because they don't know and they think that every test can be done with a capillary sample. Uh, so you might have to do a little bit of explaining to, for them, but uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, don't bring specimens in a capillary tube that cannot be performed or processed that way. Potassium levels, uh, the order of draw, uh, we said earlier we have um, in or a uh, slightly change in the order of draw for capillary punctures. And um, the abbreviation that I use to remember this is called BEOS, BEOS. B is for blood gases. Blood gases are always collected uh, first when you're doing a uh, capillary puncture, followed by your EDTA specimens, which can be various. 
Uh, you have um, other additives after that. And then lastly, your serum specimens. Remember the serum are the ones that clot, okay? So you have blood gases, EDTA, other additives such as your heparins. And lastly, you're gonna have your serum specimens, which are the ones that coagulate, All right? So remember that. Uh, potassium levels may be falsely elevated if there's tissue fluid contamination or hemolysis of the specimen. What is hemolysis? The breakdown of red blood cells. So remember that term, hemolysis. Hemo is blood, lysis is breakdown. Now, there are uh, four steps uh, uh, for the capillary puncture are, that are the same as a vein puncture. Remember, you have to have your requisition, right? You have to introduce yourself, get consent, and so on. So the first four steps are skipped, okay? So review an accession uh, test request, approach and identify the patient, prepare the patient for the procedure. If they understand, if it's a child, you, you talk to the uh, caregiver. Uh, verify any dietary restrictions, latex allergies, surgeries, anticipate any possible complications if they um, have a history of fainting or fear of blood or whatever the uh, case may be, make sure that you prepare for that, all right? Of course, you're gonna sanitize your hands, put on your gloves before you start a procedure, all right? Now, in this case, you're not gonna put any tourniquet, okay? You're gonna be performing the capillary puncture on a finger, all right? You're gonna support the arm on a fir uh, firm surface, hand extended and palm up. You're gonna be looking at the third and fourth fingers, right? One, two, three, and four. So these are the two fingers that you're gonna be performing a uh, capillary puncture in on children uh, one year older or in adults, okay? Infants zero to one will be done in the heel puncture. The young child is usually held in a lap by the parent, right, or guardian, and uh, the, the infant will be usually in a bassinet or in a, in a crib where you can perform this. However, there are some things that you have to consider when performing heel punctures in, in, a, in one of those um, areas, in a bassinet or in a or in the crib. Hold three or four fingers in a toddler's fingers. Uh, why? Because if you hold only two and this child starts to move around and, you know, they twist and turn and you might um, injure their little fingers. So by grabbing more than three, it gives you a bigger surface area that you can hold on and it's safer for the child so they don't um, hurt their fingers. In step six, we're going to select the puncture site. Okay, usually um, it's going to be, we're going to puncture in the lateral sides. It will be the, the outside or the, the medial side, lateral or medial sides of the distal end, this, this part, okay, of the finger, okay. Usually uh, you want to arterialize your specimen. Remember, use those warming devices um, over the area so you have more increased uh, blood flow to the area. It makes it easier for you to collect your specimen. It will be faster. So the skin is warm pink and a normal color. If you see that the hand is purple or blue, you definitely want to arterialize it. You want to warm it up before you even start. Do not puncture over any uh, scars or cuts or anything like that as you're not going to get any blood return, all right? If it's swollen, obviously, just like in venous punctures, you do not want to perform punctures over um, swollen areas because you're going to be contaminating your specimen, okay? Or you might even cause infections. Uh, on adults and older children, all right, the palmar surface or distal end segments of the middle ring, all right, which is your fingers, all right, and the central fleshy portion of the finger. So you're going to try to puncture, okay, the fleshy part, not on the side. You don't want to get on there because there's a bone there and you might cause uh, infection to the bone, which is called osteomyelitis, okay. In infants, on the plantar surface of the heel, so if you picture this as a baby heel, okay, you have... Uh, the size of the heel, okay? Here's a, the heel bone. You're gonna look for these sites. So you can create a V from the, between the first and second toe and this, the last uh, fourth and fifth toe and make a V, okay? And you're gonna puncture on the sides of it. Again, you wanna look for the, for the lateral edge uh, where it's uh, fleshy, okay? And it's meaty, that's where you wanna go in. Now remember never to, to puncture an infant more than two millimeters deep. You need to remember this. Never more than two millimeters deep as you might cause injury to the bone. And if they get an infection, you cause something we call uh, osteomyelitis, or if it's in the joint of the bones, then you might cause osteochondritis. Those are two terms that you need to be familiar with as they are part of your terminology in this chapter, okay? So correct selection of puncture site. Again, make sure you select it correctly. 
after reading um, uh, step six confirm that you know how to select a safe site uh, why do you not want to perform more than two millimeters as a as a requirement because uh, as you go deeper into the into the skin by maybe uh, depressing the lancet too too hard on the skin, okay, you can go deeper. And the deeper you go, the less blood flow you're gonna get. Remember, most of the capillary beds are right on the surface, right below the surface of the skin. So that's where you wanna puncture, right below the surface of the skin and not go below that, okay? Uh, the vascular beds are right below the skin. Be, uh, the epidermis, they are in the, uh, in the dermis, right? So epidermis is what we're looking at. And then you have your dermis, which is right below. This is where you have all your capillary bits. This is where all the rich uh, blood is in there, okay? So recommended site and direction of the finger puncture. Again, for the hand, you wanna puncture on the meaty part, but more so on the side. This will help you collect your specimen as you're collecting this way, the blood drops. Okay, make sure you do not make any contact with the skin. Make sure you do not scoop Okay, you do not perform any scooping motion. Try to do that. Just let the drop, press and release, you know, press and release and the blood will come into the tube by itself by capillary action, okay? Same thing in the infant heel, All right? You're gonna be on the sides. Uh, again, make sure you warm the site. Warming the site helps tremendously uh, to increase blood flow, all right? So when you're performing the the puncture, you squeeze and release. Always remember, never milk the the, the fingers or the sides, okay? Uh, sometimes you see a lot of pe uh, people do this, okay? You do not want to, you do not want to milk, okay? You do not want to do that. Why? Because you're pushing uh, intra and extracellular fluid, okay, into your sample and you're contaminating your sample, okay? It's gonna be perhaps even rejected. So make sure that you don't milk the finger, okay? Just press and release. Let the finger fill with blood again. Press, get your sample and release and keep that motion going, okay? If you had good uh, arterialized, if the site is warm, you should ha not have any problems collecting your specimen, okay? So uh, again, make sure you warm the site. Wrap the site for about three to five minutes, probably not more than that. You can use a moist uh, washcloth if you don't have one of those uh, pre-manufactured uh, kits, uh, towel, but or even sometimes even uh, uh, a diaper can work, okay? Clean and air dry the site with your normal antiseptic, which is isopropyl alcohol. Allow to air dry, do not blow dry, fan dry, or pat dry. You must let the antiseptic do its work. After you puncture the site with your Lancet device, make sure you clean, wipe off the very first uh, drop of blood. Okay, why? Because that first drop of blood is considered contaminated. All right, we don't want that in our sample. So make sure you wipe that first drop of blood, okay? Make sure you have gloves on, of course. Your equipment should be ready right next to you within the reach. Select your collection devices and, uh, and start collecting your specimens, okay? Pat open always uh, every package in front of the patient, in front of the caregiver, right? The uh, guardian, so they can see that you are using brand new sterile equipment. It just uh, gives them that reassurance that you're using uh, proper equipment. Step 10, uh, puncture the site and discard the lancet. You know that these uh, lancets are one single use only. You cannot reuse them even if you try because of the permanent retraction of the, of the needle or blade. Uh, you cannot reuse them again, and that is OSHA requirement. Uh, grasp the patient's finger between two non-dominant thumbs and finger again, or the heel, if you're grasping the heel, grasp the foot gently by the, by the heel, okay? So you're gonna be compressing and releasing, compressing and releasing, okay? You can also encircle, and this is not heel, but you can also encircle the heel, okay, so that it allows you to create that, that pressure on the heel to get more uh, blood flow going. Deeper skin punctures are more painful because pain fibers increase in abundance below 2.4. So again, how can you cause pain? When you are uh, placing the lancet on somebody's finger and you press the lancet device too deep, too hard on their skin, they will actually get um, the, the needle or blade will go deeper and that is what causes more pain. So try not to go, as long as you make good contact with the skin, that's all you need. And remember that your um, lancet device has to be perpendicular, perpendicular to the whorls of the fingertips. Okay, to remember that. If you do vertical, what's gonna happen is that your sample is going to smear down the finger and you will not be able to collect. It's gonna be very difficult. 
Okay, so make sure it's perpendicular to the whorls or fingerprints of your finger. All right, step 11, wipe away the first drop of blood, which we said, again, is typically contaminated with a lot of excess fluid. Fill and mix tubes, containers in the order of draw. We said BEOS, blood gases, EDTA samples, other additives, and then finally your serum tubes. Uh, collect slides first. If you're gonna collect a, um, a blood smear or a sample for a blood smear, it has to be collected first. Collect other anticoagulants next and serum specimens last. Touch collection tube or device to drop off blood. This is when you're gonna collect the peripheral smear. Uh, you're going to be grabbing the slide and you're going to be making very, very um, little uh, contact with the slide. The drop of blood will go on your slide. Okay. So you have your finger and you're gonna be placing your finger right by the slide and the drop will automatically go on there, okay? Once your drop goes on there, you're gonna grab another slide. You're gonna be bringing it at about 30 degrees and you push your slide there. Now, when the, the second slide makes contact with the blood, the blood is going to run side to side. It's going to run from here to here. And at this point, you, with one motion, you're supposed to push forward, right? And make what we call a feathered edge smear, okay? It is not an easy task, it takes practice, okay? So this is what you use. Put the uh, drop of blood here, bring your second uh, slide here, let the blood go from side to side and then push forward. And you should be able to make a peripheral smear that way. Uh, again, there are certain criteria that you have to meet. We'll talk about it in just a minute so that you can create a good blood smear sample, okay? Fill and mix any tubes, containers in the order of draw, all right? Again, blood gases, CDTA, other additives, and then finally your serum tubes. Place gauze and apply pressure as the patient to apply pressure. Keep the site elevated to minimize the amount of blood that is going to be uh, uh, bleeding or coming out. And label your specimens in front of the patient at the bedside and observe any special handling. Does your specimen need to be put in ice? Does it need to be uh, be covered uh, from light, protect from light? Does it need to be kept in in, um, in a warm block, et cetera? So make sure that you follow the specimen handling instructions. And we'll discuss that uh, in another chapter. Check the site after you're done. Make sure you always go back and check the site, make sure they're not bleeding and apply your bandages. Once, if the patient is doing okay, you're gonna be using uh, assisting them to uh, getting off the chair and assist them back to their to their lobby or wherever the patient may be at. Dispose of any used contaminated materials in the biohazard. Remember, only sharps go in the biohazard. You do not throw any gauzes or, any, or gloves in the biohazard or the sharps container. Thank the patient, remove your gloves and sanitize your hands. Uh, hopefully you had a successful venipuncture. Transport your specimens back to the lab, uh, especially if they ordered stat. You must remember that uh, once you, if they order stat, you need to return them so they can be processed immediately. Okay, so we continue our discussion here on uh, capillary punctures. Now, capillary blood gases are not usually collected in adults. It's very rare that we actually collect them in adults because for the most part, it is pretty safe to collect uh, arterial uh, blood gases from an adult from what usually we call the uh, radial arteries, okay? Uh, the, usually the respiratory therapists are in charge of this and they're the ones to collect these kinds of specimens. So you should not uh, be worried too much and you should not perform this procedure unless you've been trained to do so in the facility. Now, in children, sometimes uh, capillary blood gases are collected because obviously uh, arterial punctures in, in, in infants is very dangerous. So uh, capillary blood gases can be collected from a heel puncture, just like, a, or even children, more than one year old, you can also uh, perform capillary blood gases on fingers. So those would be the only two reasons why you want to collect uh, capillary blood gases on these two uh, demographics, these two types of patients. 
but again, uh, you have to consider the risks and benefits of performing these procedures on, on them. Now, there are other uh, tests that are done on kids, such as neonatal bilirubin collection. Bilirubin, uh, you might remember, is the excess production of um, uh, bilirubin because of breakdown of red blood cells. When babies are born prematurely, their red blood cells tend to break down a lot faster and therefore creating uh, excessive bilirubin. Uh, the excess bilirubin uh, flows in your in the blood and creates a yellow uh, discoloration on, on infants or babies. So that's why you see a lot of uh, babies uh, being put under what they call a billy light or ultraviolet light. This ultraviolet light helps break down uh, or minimize the breakdown of red blood cells, therefore reducing the amount of bilirubin. Now, when you have too much bilirubin in the bloodstream of an infant, it can be very uh, hazardous to their health because it can cause brain damage. So by limiting the amount of uh, red cell breakdown, you're reducing the amount of bilirubin in the bloodstream and thus decreasing the risk of this uh, infant developing brain damage. So that is one of the tests that is on, uh, on a routine basis in the uh, newborn nurseries. So now you know why the, the uh, infants are placed in Billy light. Okay, it's a very important test. It has to be done uh, correctly so that we can get accurate results so kids can get the right treatment. Other tests uh, that are done uh, with capillary punctures are newborn screenings, and these are done very, very commonly. Uh, newborn na neonatal screenings are done, uh, they're required by law. Uh, every hospital has to perform a, the newborn screening test on every single child, and they're done usually uh, twice during their stay in the hospital. One of the common tests that are, that are uh, evaluated or noted is called PKU or phenoketonuria. Phenoketonuria is a, is a genetic uh, disorder characterized by a defect in the enzyme that breaks down the amino acid phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is one of the proteins that, uh, that our body requires. So if you don't have this uh, protein, then your body is unable to to process a lot of things because we function a lot with proteins and if your body cannot uh, break down uh, PKU, then you will not have phenylalanine and therefore you're going to have some growth problems. Without uh, any intervention, phenylalanine, all right, which is in most all foods, okay, you will have impaired growth, impaired development and so on. So it's very important that this problem be identified, okay? right from the very beginning so that you can identify and take any uh, necessary action uh, uh, before the child starts to develop. PKU cannot be cured, but uh, phenylketones in the urine, uh, but it can be treated with diets low in phenylalanine, okay? So again, phenylalanine is almost in every other food that we eat, and that's why it's important that babies are identified uh, with this problem if they have it or not. Uh, excess phenylalanine and the bloodstream can cause brain damage. Okay, so again, it's very important that is, this problem be identified uh, very early in, um, in the stages of birth. Another problem is hypothyroidism. Hypo means low. Thyroid, thyroid obviously refers to your thyroid gland. Okay, hypo means low function, low function of your thyroid gland. If the child is born with this problem, uh, what can happen? Well, the Thyroid hormones play a big, big role in your metabolism, in your growth, and so on. So if this gland is not functioning at its right level, then obviously the child will not develop correctly. Okay, you will have a lot of growth problems and brain development problems, maybe learning disabilities and so on. So again, this is one of the newborn screenings that is performed routinely on children as soon as they are born. Um, another uh, test that is also done is galactosemia. It's one of your um, newborn screening tests. And uh, this is an inherited problem. Uh, sometimes it runs in families uh, caused by a lack of enzyme needed to convert milk sugar, galactose into glucose. So if you're, most babies are obviously raised uh, with milk, okay? And they must have the ability to convert galactose, which is in, in your milk, into glucose. And if they don't have that ability, obviously they will not be able to function normally, okay? they will have low glucose levels, okay? And with low glucose levels, obviously nobody can survive. We all need to have sugar in our bodies. And an infant that, is, that has not the ability to, uh, to utilize, to make that conversion from galactose to glucose, well, can obviously is gonna have a lot of uh, met metabolic problems and can perhaps even die. So it's very, very important that this uh, 
a screening be performed very as soon as they are as soon as they are born. Another common test that is also performed in human screening is uh, for cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a condition where your glands produce too much uh, mucus, mucus or phlegm, and it impairs the normal functions of the cells around it. Okay, so if those cells uh, pre pre form or produce rather, they produce too much uh, uh, waste or too much uh, mucus, then it's going to stop or hinder the ability of the, uh, the organ itself to function normally, therefore uh, affecting largely the, uh, the overall function of the, of the system, okay? Every organ, every system has different organs, but if one organ fails, then there's going to be a domino effect, okay? So there's other problems that can occur. Cystic fibrosis is a, a genetic, it's a genetic problem caused by one or more mutations in, in genes that directs a protein responsible for regulating the transport of chloride across some membrane. So chloride, uh, some people call it the chloride test also. Okay, chloride is uh, always come together with salt. So sometimes they even call it a sweat test. So they grab a, a sample uh, from the skin, okay? And if they see there's too much chloride in that, in that uh, sample, then they can uh, continue the investigation to see if the child has a problem with cystic fibrosis. Very, very, um, it's not too common, okay? But uh, it is, um, it is uh, a chronic problem. If a child is diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, uh, they're going to have a lot of metabolic problems, a lot of problems with nutrition, and uh, sometimes, many times, with respiratory problems. They end up being uh, requiring a, a tracheostomy to be placed in them so that they can breathe easier and better. So again, uh, most uh, sweat tests uh, are ideally performed in the infants between 24 to 72 hours uh, old. So right away, as soon as you're born, this test has to be performed so they can identify any problems. So how do we collect um, newborn screenings? How do we collect newborn screenings? We collect them by using what they call a, um, a blood spot collection. Okay, blood spot collection. All right, so I think we lost our connection here for just a second, but uh, I was just talking about the blood spot collection that has to be uh, performed correctly uh, using a lay your forms on that area and they're contaminated, then your specimen is going to be contaminated. Now, the circles have to be filled completely, okay? So when you put your heel, the paper against the, uh, the heel, make sure that you have a good blood flow, okay? You don't want to over, go to way over the circle, okay? You want to just enough to fill that little circle. And when you uh, fill the circle, you turn the paper over and make sure that it went through the other side. Okay. Now, once you collect the specimen, you're going to have to lay it on a flat surface so that it dries out. You do not want to hang it as the blood may smear down. Okay. You do not want to overlap these papers on each other because they will stick. Blood can has a sticky or will clot, right? So it has a tendency to, to, um, to stick to anything. So make sure that you don't overlap these papers when you're collecting them. 
<clears throat> Again, uh, remember uh, the substances that are uh, have been identified as contaminants in newborn screening specimens include alcohol, uh, blood formula, lotion, powder, and urine. So make sure that these are not in your specimens. We, I touched a little bit on peripheral smears. Um, these again are done using a capillary, capillary puncture. You're gonna be, on adults, we'll be using obviously the third and the fourth fingers, either or, okay? Remember to arterialize your specimen so you can get a good blood flow going. Uh, you're going to grab your slides, okay? You're gonna be putting it against the drop of blood. Make sure you wipe off the first one, okay? You know, put your drop of blood here. Turn it over, and with the second slide, you're gonna come in here about 30 degrees, and you're gonna push it forward. You wanna create a, a feathered edge, okay? You wanna create a smear that is acceptable. What is an acceptable smear? Uh, the smear has to be about two thirds of the slide, it has to fill about two thirds of the slide. So one, two, okay? It has to be, go from thick to thin, and the edges have to be feathered out. It means it kind of uh, vanishes out, right? It thins out from thick, thin, 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 thin. Why do you want to do that? Because when the uh, technologist is evaluating the specimen, they look at the feathered edges. That is what they want to look at. Why? Because that is the smallest layer of cells that they can look at. And this test is usually done to perform what they call a, uh, a differential count to see how many red blood cells the person actually has in their bloodstream. So you have to have this very thin layer so that the technologists can actually uh, be able to count the number of cells. Obviously they count a very you know small area and then they, they have the formulas to perform that test. But again, it's not um, done very uh, routinely and there is machines that actually can do it for us and they do it perfect every single time. So routine blood film, uh, smear preparation again, Remember the um, characteristics of a, of a good smear, okay? Uh, these uh, smears might be collected from an ADTA tube, all right? So an acceptable smear covers about one half to three fourths of the surface of the slide. Half to three fourths of the surface of the slide has no holes, no lines, no jagged edges, okay? And the thinnest area, properly made smear often referred to as feathered edges. That is a properly performed smear, and we'll practice that in, cl in a class uh, on our next meeting. Thick blood smears, uh, again, these are used, uh, can be used for several tests, including malaria. Uh, they're diagnosed with the presence of organisms in the blood. Very large drop of blood is placed in the center of the glass. Uh, the drop is spread with the corner of another slide to cover slip until the size of a dime, okay? So again, peripheral smears is one of the topics that is covered in your national certification exam. And it's important to you to know how, how the procedure is performed, what constitutes a, a, a proper or adequate smear, okay? So that you can be at least knowledgeable. Again, you may not be responsible to perform them. A lot of times they're left for the uh, technologist in the lab that process the specimens to do this for us. So don't worry too much about it, but you do have to know uh, what um, peripheral, peripheral smears are, how they're performed, and what constitutes a, a proper smear. Again, half to two-thirds of the slide have to be filled, okay? Uh, it has to be spread out, and the edges have to be feathered or very, very thin layer. That is the only way the technologists can have a, a, a good count of the cells. Okay, um, we've covered a lot of topics, okay, uh, uh, different routines uh, in capillary punctures. Uh, make sure you're familiarized with the procedure itself, the proper way of collecting a capillary uh, blood sample, when are they appropriate for children and adults, okay, and how to handle. Uh, we talked about the order of draw for capillary specimens, which is a little bit different, so make sure you're familiar with that. You know, you, by now you should know the difference between arterial blood 
venous blood and capillary blood. Uh, the types of patient specimens that are analyzed in the clinical lab. <clears throat> the phlebotomist role in collecting and supporting specimens. Remember that not all specimens are just, you know, carried out and normal. Some of them have to be uh, protected from light, such as your bilirubin. So some specimens have to be placed in ice, such as your capillary blood gases. Okay, so you make sure you're familiar with the handling uh, of these specimens when transporting them to the lab, okay? Um, some of the samples uh, cannot be collected in capillary uh, blood tubes. So again, remember those are usually your, um, your uh, coagulation studies. Your blood gases is another one, okay? Your ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And some of the tests that require large amounts of blood, like blood cultures, cannot be performed in capillary blood gases. So take that into consideration when a patient may be asking you, well, you know, uh, in another hospital they did, um, you know, a, a finger stick and they collared my sample that way. Well, maybe this, that was a different kind of test that could have been performed with capillary samples, but uh, if that's not the case, they may not. If they continue to, to refuse, then obviously you have to communicate with your healthcare providers or nurses or doctors and let them know that the patient has questions or doubts about the procedure. So refer them to that, um, in that case. You should be knowledgeable about the equipment that is used in um, capillary collections. We talked about the, um, the uh, various uh, hematocrit tubes. Okay, we talked about the micro collection tubes, the capillary blood gas kits, the lancet devices. We talked about the slides, okay? And so, so you should be a little bit familiar with them and we'll get to practice those in the next session. Um, when, uh, how do you select the area for uh, capillary blood, uh, blood collections on adults and children, who can you collect it? Um, children usually over one year, you can collect a capillary finger stick. Remember that safety is important. So you make sure they grasp more than two fingers on a child, usually th preferably three uh, fingers that you don't injure a child. Uh, remember it's always in the distal, the distal area of the fingers, which would be the, the ends of the fingers and the meaty part or the fleshy part. Okay, those are gonna be your sites to collect sample. Remember that you have to arterialize your site to make sure it's warm so you have good adequate blood flow. Uh, remember not to collect specimens when they are swollen, when you see a redness or an infection, when there's edema or swelling. Uh, if there's any impaired mobility in that hand or arm, remember that. Any contraindications of, uh, of, for you collecting specimens from that arm, make sure that are followed, such as history of surgeries, history of um, mastectomies and so on, uh, dialysis grafts, it, it applies the same like venous punctures. Uh, the special precautions necessary during blood collections uh, by venous puncture and capillary puncture. If you do collect a, a um, venous specimen and you place it on a capillary uh, tube, make sure that you label the specimens as venous so that the technologists can understand and use the different reference ranges for the different types of specimens. So remember that. We've covered uh, uh, several topics again in capillary punctures and hopefully you have a good idea of what it uh, what a puncture site requires and what you can do and cannot do. If you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to uh, send me an email, okay? And we can discuss this uh, more in depth uh, regarding about anything that we covered here in chapter 10. So for now, I'm going to in this lecture and uh, we can continue the discussion on our next meeting. So until then, we'll see you. Thank you for joining.